any minute now. It says it's recording. Excellent. We'll see if it actually is. Uh, all right, welcome to the KCP community meeting, November 23rd, 2021. We have a few items on the agenda. Now it tells me that it's recording, so we'll see if that gets cut off. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to share and go through. Uh, Stefan was asking. I don't know if he is here. Well, it'll be recorded anyway. Uh, the uh, for for a sort of a walkthrough uh, of how namespace scheduler works or mostly works today. Um, it's pretty simple. It's not terribly. Um, deep though, there's a couple of little tricks it plays. Um, so this is this is a this will become a PR or this is the PR uh, that's out right now. But um, basically, it well it has it has a couple of tricks. One of the tricks is I kept needing to translate a GBK into a GBR, and so I built this little doodad to do that for me uh, to start that away. Uh, this is another trick it does. Can, you, can everybody, this is big enough? I guess it's taking up half the screen. Um, but um, one thing it needs to do is, uh, well, let me step back. So what the, what the namespace scheduler does is anytime it sees a namespace in any workspace, it tries to pick a cluster for it. Right now it's very random. It says, list all my clusters, pick one at random assign that namespace to that um, to that physical cluster across all workspaces. Um, and the other thing it needs to do is anytime it sees a new resource in any of those namespaces, assign that resource to the same uh, physical cluster as its namespace. So it looks up its namespace by name in its workspace, and it says, what cluster are you assigned to? Assign me to the same thing. Um, it needs to do this for every resource of every type in that workspace. Uh, and so uh, one of the things it does is it has this dynamic discovery shared informer factory. It's basically a collection of shared informer factories, dynamic shared inf informer factories um, that it starts up uh, inside start. It discovers all the types in this workspace, and then it pulls every, I forget how often, minute, something like that, 10 seconds, pull types every minute. Um, and discovers new types that have recently been added to this workspace and starts up informers for those two. Um, and then it it tries to look exactly like a shared informer factory to everybody else with event handler and um, these handler funks. Uh, we'll show later how that actually looks to use it. Um, but basically, every minute it will look up the types using discovery, filter out some that it knows it doesn't care about, namespace or non-namespace things, cluster scope things it knows it doesn't care about. If it can't list it or can't watch it, it doesn't care about it. Um, this is, if it's new, start a dynamic shared informer factory for it with the uh, event handlers and run it. It doesn't currently forget about types. There's a to-do somewhere in here to forget about types when that type goes away. It doesn't need to keep an informer open for it. But uh, for now, this works fine. Um, this is the namespace controller. Uh, Andy was co completely correct that it should not take a REST config. I will fix that before too long. Um, but basically, it sets up a discovery client, a dynamic client, a typed client, and a cluster client to look at clusters. Uh, these are. This is starting to get confusing. These are physical cluster objects in the cluster CRD that we have, um, uh, and not logical clusters, which is something we will also come up with later. So it sets up the dynamic discovery thing and just says, anytime a new resource of any type or any newly discovered type shows up, uh, and queue it in a work queue of resources to care about. Anytime a cluster change happens, tell me. Anytime a namespace change happens, tell me. Uh, it doesn't care, it doesn't currently care about deleting stuff or deleting, sorry, it does care about deleting uh, clusters, but it doesn't care about deleting objects or namespaces because there's nothing to do when those happen. Um, it filters, this was also Andy's recommendation that it filters before actually enqueuing anything. If it's not, um, uh, if it can't parse the key, 
this was something that was recently uh, broken that I think we're fixing about it. I'll get to it later, but we only care about admin cluster for now. It needs to become fully multi, multi workspace, multi logical cluster aware, but for now, uh, it should only care about admin clusters. And then it skips anything in uh, kube system, kube public um, namespaces that it shouldn't sync down, basically. I think we'll probably have this be more of a policy thing so that you can specify other namespaces that you don't want to care about. But for now, it's just hard coded. Same filtering for namespaces. Uh, when it enqueues a resource, it's key in the queue. Any questions? Uh, never mind. I'll, just, oh, okay. uh, I uh, I'll do it later. OK. <laughs> it's not important. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it's currently using one queue for everything. For So it's putting namespaces in the same queues as resources and cluster updates. I don't know. I don't know if this matters. I don't know if we care. Uh, but that's something that we might want to do later is have three different queues for these. Um, processing work items, it then splits it out and says, if this is a namespace key, process namespace. If it's a cluster uh, update, process it like a cluster. Anything else, process it like a resource. Some, some error handling stuff. When it processes a resource, all the interesting stuff is processing resources, basically. But uh, when it when it gets that, it splits out everything and then passes in the logical cluster name of that resource, the unstructured object, and its uh, GBR, its group version resource. Oh, here's that namespace block list. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll keep going to the next thing. The interesting part in here, in reconciling a resource, it looks up in the cache and the in the um, lister cache its namespace in the same logical cluster. This was nice. If it's already assigned to the right cluster, it doesn't have anything to do. Otherwise, it patches. It patches with merge uh, merge patch. It should probably use a JSON patch. Um, but for now, this works. For namespace, when it reconciles a namespace, if it doesn't have an assignment, it will list all clusters. It will to do filter out on ready clusters um, and set the assignment. This is something else. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Steve says, explain why JSON patch. Uh, I don't have a strong. Uh, preference either way. Um, but my understanding is that JSON patch works for everything and merge patch only works for some things. Is that? It's strategic merge patch that only works for some oh. things. Um, you should be able to do either JSON or merge patch for JSON Fantastic. things. And I have no reason not to use merge patch. Well, <laughs> actually, you should probably use server side apply, but I don't, I don't have to change that now. But like sure. any place where you're any place where you're basically trying to to make the updates over time, um, this would be an interesting place to try it. It's not in any way critical, but like that would allow you to basically dispatch and say, "Hey, like this is what I expect it to be," after it's gone through all the internal calculations of whatever you decided the object is, and that becomes the service problem. So, in theory, Sinker is a perfect use case for server side apply. So it's not. Uh... It doesn't care what the value was ever. It's only ever setting a label on an object. Uh, and so That's I don't think it matters if it. Still a server side apply if a human comes along and changes that value. Right. If a human comes in and sets it to something else, then this reconciler will put it back. Right. And again, like it's, uh, it's a useful input to the next kind of iterations. It's not critical now. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, great. Uh, yeah, so after, uh, if, if a namespace is not assigned to a physical cluster, uh, it picked one at random and patches it. If or it doesn't currently check if it, or it doesn't do anything if the cluster is, isn't ready currently, but it should reassign away from it or intelligently not assign it in the first place if that cluster isn't ready. And then this was 
uh, this is all going to get moved elsewhere. But basically, as soon as after the namespace gets uh, assigned, it goes and looks up all objects in that namespace and then also assigns it to that um, to that same physical cluster. This should be done. This is just in, in queue items for all of these in uh, so that reconcile resource is responsible for this. So it's not just like blocking doing this for every resource in the namespace. Uh, it can just spew a bunch of uh, uh, items into the queue and those uh, queue items can happen asynchronously. May, may I ask a question, uh, Jason? Yeah. yeah. Um, in the existing way, API negotiation, I mean, initial API negotiation is, is implemented regarding types imported from physical clusters. We now maintain on, on each physical cluster object a list of the APIs that should be synced. In mm -hmm. case, for example, uh, um, in the case a given physical cluster had a change on a just on a given API that made it incompatible with the, you know, accepted negotiated uh, API schema in the logical cluster. So now we have, I mean, changed the granularity of, of what is supported or not on by each physical cluster and what should be seen by to each physical cluster. We change the granularity, sorry, granularity to um, the level of the API uh, itself. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Is it something that is taken in account here? And how would we, would we manage that, knowing that the whole point of this controller is to um, sync all the objects of all the types of a given namespace? So, I mean, how does it relate? Yeah, currently, this doesn't take any of that into account. Um, mm -hmm. This is just going to go through everything, whether or not it will end up getting synced there. Uh, according to the sinker's logic or, or API negotiation, it could be smarter and take, in, take into account only types that are negotiated to end up on that on that cluster. Like you said, if it's not if it's not going to be valid down there, then we shouldn't we can we can avoid the work of assigning it there because nothing will sink it down. Yeah, yeah. And my question was, well, how we uh, because for now the the, the idea of syncing all the content of a given namespace to a given physical cluster is mainly to simplify um, the question of, you know, the relationship uh, between objects and the inter interdependency of objects inside a namespace. Mm -hmm. So I assume that that we would still want to keep this uh, constraint of moving either known or all of the objects of a given namespace to a given physical cluster. So maybe it would be, you know, as soon as there is one API, uh, that cannot be synced to a given physical cluster, then we would just do not sync any object of this namespace. I mean, I, I'm just yeah. asking the question. I, I mean, don't have the answer. Remember, so the act of assigning an object to a physical cluster is a is a distributed transaction. Mm -hmm. So once it's been assigned, everything that moves that object is a two-phase commit from that on, like in the classic database sense. You have to indicate your desire to move, and then if something that like if you have two participants you basically have to wait for that other participant to act that to to move it off and so even in that case like if the api object the thing you have to do at the top level is like hey this is no longer a candidate anybody who's already assigned it's still a move right there is no there is no like stop so that's got to happen at the higher level and then the sinker would treat that as no different from any other remove but that's a that's still a like in the in the big sequence diagram in the sky of the state machine here. It's once you're assigned, you are owned by that cluster. And you have to wait for all that. So it's still like it's a loop outside of the sinker, roughly. Like the mm, scheduler has yeah. to re has to detect that, indicate it, that has to propagate. Ideally, that's completely opaque mm. to the sinker and the scheduler, um, which is or maybe it's not, like because the scheduler does need some bit of feedback there. But somebody has to make that pushback decision. And it's probably like the sinker knows when it fails on an individual cluster. But once that, the sinker is also responsible for telling the API server about the updated schema of the object, right? Like the source of truth for a type is on the physical cluster. So the sinker yeah. has two roles one, to keep those API types up to date on KCP side. And then the other is to act on the flow through if we fail here that back pressure mechanism is a back off failure that's an unexpected failure 
when the API type changes, that's got to go up, propagate over, come back, and then that should result in the sinker seeing less things, seeing things be moving off. Yeah, yeah. So um, this doesn't currently take into into account API compatibility or you know type compatibility mm -hmm. when it tries to schedule. It literally just randomly selects a cluster and eats it into it and hopes it works. But that is an interesting case where it when it does take into account the uh, the types available on that physical cluster, it it is it, it can still schedule whole namespaces. And if a foo object shows up and that foo object in this namespace is not compatible with the mm. uh, cluster that that namespace is assigned to, that should, I think, is what we're saying, trigger an unschedule of that namespace yeah. and a reschedule yeah. of it to a to a cluster. And then then it can redo the the not just like pick a cluster at random, but among the clusters available to me, which have hmm. which have a compatible type for all the types I am about to give it. Um, yeah, it's it's a descheduling of the whole namespace. That was my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 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 currently very dumb and is going to just do the whole namespace. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. schedule it for that, and the syncer will try to apply it, and it doesn't get any of that bad pressure back up to say. Oh, you're going to give me a foo. I don't know. Or like my definition of foo is incompatible with your definition of foo. Unschedule of the whole namespace and reschedule and you know redo the, mm -hmm. the scheduling like compatibility check uh, mm -hmm. on some other cluster to find where it can go. So so this is maybe we can tee this up for the end of this section, but I was going to ask is like going from like the simple one, has it reached its for the simple one, has it reached the maximum amount of uh, of nutrients we can extract from the from the the bone? And now we're ready to go to the next set of questions. Or do you like what's your thought process, Jason, on where you go from this to the next? So what's this, the transition step? Uh, where the next is is type aware scheduling, or yeah. Uh, currently, it also it needs to take into account cluster health. So after this, I'm going to start working on the Sinker side of things, where Sinker, so Sinker doesn't currently rename the namespace when it comes through. If two logical clusters have a default namespace, it's going to try to end up as default on the same on the same physical cluster, and that's that's not going to work. Um, so I need to have Sinker do the namespace uh, mapping, uh, and then also take into account at least cluster health. When it tries to schedule, like do more than just randomly select a cluster and and uh, demoing, deleting a cluster or marking it as unhealthy or you know like tricking it into unhealthiness and having the namespace pick up and move somewhere else. That's that's probably next. And then so, that gives us a nice foothold for oh, it's starting to make decisions about a cluster before it sends resources there. That's a good spot to plug in. Are its types compatible with my types for all types I have? So. It, at least when you're thinking about like execution on this, um, is that also a, a a a a second stage prototype that will then be replaced by a third stage thing, or do you think that you're ready to start making fundamental decisions about the architecture of the loop? Do you want to do the loop first before you do it? Because I, I don't think there's anything wrong with proto like say this is prototype one. And there's prototype two, and then potentially saying like we'll wait for proto phase three to go and look at longer term like code reuse, like drawing a diagram. Do, is there still like we need to actually pull all the problems into memory before like in uh, your memory, human memory, and discuss them before we go to phase three, or do you think phase two is where you can start cutting out like long term design? I think phase two is 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 a good spot for that. I mean, I don't I don't think aside from cluster health and API compatibility. I think we can have a very compelling uh, prototype with just those two things. Like beyond that is things like cluster uh, capacity, like re remaining compute capacity or, or whatever. And I feel like that's a much larger problem for, I mean, useful, very important, but not like yeah, I, for I, the next prototype. Basically like one of the things that's going through my head is like, um, at what point do we evaluate the existing scheduler and the scheduler framework in cube and how we use it for nodes in the context of its usefulness for this problem and how do we how do we get to the com comfort level that we can either say three quarters of the problems overlap we can reuse that infrastructure and that's a net win or you know one quarter of the infrastructure overlaps and we'd end up rewriting three quarters of it anyway so we need to take the bones of it versus ah the core algorithm and the core loop is actually fundamentally different because the cube scheduler is a one-shot scheduler um, 
Yeah, I think I think my the the more I have looked into this, the more I am convinced that this is a different problem than the like existing coop scheduler. Right, it, but you're still going to have to deal with things like bulking, priority weighting, uh, modeling capacity, and all that. So, yeah. like, when do we do the about? Like, what 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 phase is where we evaluate the parts of that? Because certainly, you are absolutely right. Uh, you're going to have to have a reasonably efficient um scheduler if we're doing per type scheduling or per object scheduling because you're effectively doing one write for every object that's in a transparent multi-cluster workspace mm -hmm. um, and so you're talking about potentially holding um, large chunks of the whole cluster in memory so that we start getting into the sharding working set problem and so that that gets into like um, the efficiency of the caches that you need to support making some of these decisions uh, they're going to be probably simpler than cubes in some dimensions but they're going to be you know, more complex than others because you're going to have to look at portions of the object that Cube doesn't look at. More objects and more of them, whereas Cube only looks at pods, nodes, and a few um, related resources. Yeah, I mean, it, um, I think we can yep. also cheat and have the, the sinker, you know, if, if this cluster doesn't want to have, we could reuse the, the, the actual Kube scheduler logic by virtue of it being involved in the physical clusters, and the sinker can say, "Oh, this like this cluster didn't want more than a hundred foos in this namespace." Bubble that that error up, rather than re-implement it up here. Have it try that cluster, and when it fails, learn from that to move it somewhere else. That way, we get the best of both worlds. We don't have to have logic at both levels to enforce that. But and, and that's actually a really fair point because, and and this is like I think this is like the uh, this is a design doc that comes off transparent multi-cluster which is like at least a proposal for what this the scheduler architecture is and what the flow architecture like transparent multi-cluster design doc has most of this but something that's very clearly like we expect to take this as input make this decision flow it out to here when like the state diagram or the flow diagram maybe it's just an addition to the existing tmc design but like that clarification is really important for when we're committing to it something that's maybe six months to a year of lifespan um we don't have a commitment yet for prototype two to live that long or to mm -hmm. to be the source of continuous evolution i'm just trying to every problem we're looking at is does it is it ready at the seed ready in prototype two to go to next phase like we actually just take it and evolve it and it, it's good or we we run it into the real world and see what gets shaved off or is it a we still need more info um, the space is big enough that we're not confident enough that we try it and then we do it with the model that we're going to get the maximum amount of information in prototype two and then throw it away and use something different uh, or be able to replace yeah. it with something else in the future. Yeah. Uh, something else that has occurred to me, you, you said that this will fundamentally need to do a write for every object in every namespace, like in order to set that label, in order to set scheduling. Is this something else we can use a virtual uh workspace view for where so instead of going through and labeling each object in the namespace with its namespaces cluster assignment we could have some uh and storing those you know each of those updates we could have something that uh, the sinker talks to that says give me things that i care about where things i care about are either objects labeled for me or objects in a namespace labeled for me and now i only yeah. have to label the namespace I think that's like a fundamental sinker, scheduler, KCP, transparent multi-cluster design point, which is if we don't write the object and we write something else, then we still have to map that right to the object, yeah. or we have to stop watching objects. And so does an end user need to see where every object is in a transparent multi-cluster? Maybe. There's transactional integrity concerns there, which is if you ever want to run two objects at the same time, someone deletes the object out from underneath you and it's not modeled in the same object. So I'd probably say like, my gut's telling me just looking at the problem space, we need to get formal about it, is we're still writing to the object. It's OK to make one write to every transparent multi-cluster object if the write rate is ridiculously low. And it's probably likely that the write rate is ridiculously low, except on failure transitions when we yeah, move yeah, yeah. 100,000 objects from cluster A to cluster B. Yeah, that's exactly the case I'm worried about, is when yeah, 100,000 objects are scheduled to a physical cluster and it goes away. 
or yeah, worse, like yeah. flaps. Like the, it, it's it's fine if it just disappears. It really sucks if every five minutes it shows up and says, "I'm healthy. I'm unhealthy. I'm healthy. I'm unhealthy." Yeah. So so this is that like we getting to the point where we start from prototype one, prototype two. I need to. I, I like to see. We really need a really crisp like either one proposed flow that we can then pick apart and talk about like order of magnitude where the rights go, like. I, Rights on object probably is fundamental just because of all the other things we've said so far, but we should test the, we should make sure we have a design thing that we can talk about those terms. I guess I was just asking is prototype two where you're going to try these designs or prototype two where we're going to be like, we know enough now to go through design and to hammer it out in words. We don't need to go out through in code. Do we all, do, you, do we have enough breadth of understanding of the problem now to really attack and come up with a draft design that we'd be comfortable with for a year's time? Uh, hey. so, oh, sorry, go ahead, David. No, no, sorry. Um, I have another question on the PR, and maybe it's related also to prototype two or you know execution steps. Is uh, how this how does this PR re uh, relate to you know the thinker um, watching uh, objects in any logical cluster or any workspace that is um, uh, that that. Um, this physical cluster joined to. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, yeah. because I mean, I'm mainly asking the question uh, uh, related to the way we discover the various API through discovery. Because here, if I understand correctly, you are mainly pointing to the discovery published by a given logical cluster, but a single one. And so, obviously, from you know. Uh, in what we are um, discussing regarding API model, there is also all this question of API view uh, calculating either the LCD or uh, the contrary, you know, to, to uh, try to merge or at least negotiate a number of APIs that have some variance. So, I mean, how do uh, how does this work uh, relate and how um, how much do, does it integrate the the, the, the current work or uh, and the goal of having a sinker that would be able to watch across a high number of logical cluster or workspaces uh, to sync uh, to a given physical cluster? I mean, that's not clear say, for me. Right. I would say this work does not does not try to address that. The next mm -hmm. thing after this is going to have like improvements to the sinker to process this across many workspaces and that's where that will start to be uh, mm, i mean okay. as a silly yeah. hack i can have something that just lists all logical uh logical clusters and does watches on all of them but that's not gonna i mean mm. that will work but will not scale we need to uh have a better view a better way of serving i am a sinker and i'm interested in objects for me across all workspaces not, not yeah all and 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 to be fair, this is a fundamental security thing, right? Like the end of it, the end goal, it's just like a node, which is if do you if a sinker is compromised, should the sinker be able to see workloads that aren't scheduled to it? No. Should the sinker so, see uh, secrets not scheduled to it? No. Mm -hmm. So I think like we put this, this goes in like um uh it may not be a hard requirement from a modeling perspective, but odds are it's probably going to be something along the lines of there will be a, some sort of virtual workspace for a sinker that looks similar yeah. to the okay. controllers, but it's not identical. And that virtual mm -hmm. workspace's job is to prevent the disclosure of information and mm -hmm. potentially to reduce the amount. It shouldn't have to read every object in every workspace on mm -hmm. every shard yeah. to do its job. That is the hard like we, we kind of like punted on workspace index right we said like well we can probably keep workspace in, in a single shard it's not that bad we will not be keeping an index of every object on every workspace in every shard in memory that won't work so so, so finally th this work could be i mean could mainly still like this and the question of you know gathering the apis and the object from a number of um quite high number of workspaces would be managed by the virtual workspace. This uh, namespace control, this um, um, controller sinker is, would, would point yes. to, I mean. Finally, a controller, for the, like a cubelet yeah, controller. For the yeah. sinker, uh, it would just, um, you know, think that that it's, it, it, it 
um, points to a given uh, cluster. And then it, it just points to a virtual workspace that will gather everything required, be it on the API level or on the instance levels. Uh, that is, you know, that has to be seen by the thinker according to view options. We want I, I want to view objects related to those types of APIs that have to be, you know, negotiated, etc. And then the virtual workspace, which is mainly between the thinker and and KCP, will provide the thinker everything that he has to see. Is it the how access? We... The access pattern of a sinker. Uh, so the access pattern of a controller across workspaces. And the access yeah. pattern of a sinker across workspaces are similar in one part. In all cases, the access pattern is what's really critical, right? Like Cube, mm -hmm. all controllers basically have the same access pattern. And Cube, like there's only like three types of queries. There's all on a cluster, something in a namespace, mm -hmm. or something by a global field selector like pods, mm -hmm. like the pods back host name the three access patterns that we are talking about making working through virtual workspaces are the pod the spec host name which is a field selector on cluster like for sinker which is what yeah. the sinker label is is a field yeah. selector on where you're placed um, the controller which is all api types and then we haven't identified an exact equivalent of the third one but it's probably a controller either on a shard or a controller on a single workspace which are fairly trivial we're not worried about mm -hmm. them we don't know if we have a fourth access pattern yet. Um, some of the stuff maybe like Stefan's probing at, and um, we'll probably get to some questions where we might actually come up with some new access patterns. Which means that there would be quite few changes to the existing uh, namespace scheduler um, controller. Yeah, like the, if we finally the, the, the complicated work on APIs uh, is managed by, by uh, the virtual workspace. Yeah, right. it's just what, whatever is feeding your lister will be changing, and then you'll handle it the same way. Hmm. Right. Um, okay, great. I am more than happy to keep talking about this because I think it, it's interesting, <laughs> but also I wanted to see if uh, Andy wanted to talk about API inheritance uh, status issues blockers, and Clayton promised us a brain dump on uh, database. Sure. Nerds. So I uh, have been experimenting on a concept that uh, Clayton and David and I were talking about a few weeks ago, which I think I talked about at last week or the week before community meeting. Uh, but just to recap, the idea is just a prototype for saying I have a workspace and then it can inherit APIs from some other workspace. And this is really more of an exercise of figuring out what sort of changes we potentially need to make to discovery and to custom resource handling, and at some point, open API probably as well, um, to see what happens when we want to say that uh, a CRD that lives in a source workspace is accessible in a target workspace. And as a consumer of that target workspace, you're none the wiser that you didn't actually create that CRD in your logical cluster. And so I got discovery working for slash APIs, which is done by the aggregator, and slash APIs slash a specific group, which is also handled by the aggregator. Where I ran into problems was at the version level, which is handled by the API extensions code, so the custom resource discovery and handlers. Uh, custom resource discovery is implemented via a controller that basically feeds static data structures that live um, and are, are referenced when someone asks for discovery. Mm -hmm. And the controller makes it fairly difficult for me to try and do what I did with aggregation, where I'm injecting a decorator that basically, if you don't inject anything, if you're the normal cube aggregator and, and whatnot, everything works normally. But if you're KCP and you inject a decorator, we can do things like say, oh, you asked for slash APIs in your workspace. We'll go see if there's any other APIs that we need to add from your inherited workspace. Um, same thing with the, the version level. Um, 
Stefan, you want to ask now, or you yeah, want just to... just yeah. a quick question: Is there any technical reason that this is a control line upstream? Sorry, I, I didn't understand that. Is there a technical reason that this is a control line upstream and not just a in real time ah. computed discovery mm -hmm. handler? I don't know the history. I'd probably have to go and ask David. I I, I got to be honest. I'm pretty sure it was. We were like, hey, we got some controllers. We'll do some more controllers and some controllers and get some controllers. There were reasons for it, like reconciliation, but um, at the time, controller pattern. I, I would probably say my 90% guess on what David's answer is going to be is it was the simplest pattern that matched all the other problems we were solving, and there was no need to go anything further. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, initially, it was mainly just accommodating the existing, um, uh, what was existing in Cube. And I think in the current state of things, we might. Uh, Sorry, I meant the other David. Yeah, David. I meant, David. Yeah, sure. yeah. I meant like but, uh, David's I, original reason for it. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I'm just meaning um, there is something probably that, that complicates uh, things is the requirement, if I understood correctly, in, initially in Cube, to uh, publish discovery for both um, CRDs and, uh, ag um, you know, API. Um, aggregated API servers. And so uh, to sort of um, merge both, we just, um, we th there is, you know, the CRD registration controller that mainly takes the CRD and creates the API services uh, uh, objects for the aggregator to take them in account. And so it's but a sort of for additional... The for the higher sort of, discovery, it's not yeah. for the version. I think here we could get rid of it. That's my point. Yeah, exactly. We could get rid, of, get rid of, of it because now in, in, in KCP, we just don't have uh, the, the aggregator. I mean, we have it. Uh, even, even, even in Cube, we, we don't, don't need use that. It. That's, that's, that's my yeah. claim. And Clayton also has 90% yeah, I, confidence. I, I think, and David might, David might have other reasons that he might remember. I, I feel like ultimately we did, even CRDs that we were, there's like three places where CRDs plug into the infrastructure that were, mm -hmm. we didn't, we did the, I don't wanna say lowest cost, but we did the practical, you know, we were working from TPRs and their their things. We reorganized some of the, the handler chain, we reorganized the serving chain. And I think that we picked the abstraction that worked fine for a thousand CRDs, but we did not, we did not have the design goal to get to 10,000 or a hundred thousand mm -hmm. CRDs per server. And so some of the things that we, it just wasn't a design constraint, uh, but yeah, it'd be great to figure it out with with Eads and see if he remembers anything else. Andy, that'd be a good thing to do. Yeah. So like fast forwarding to the actual problem. So like let's say that the controller thing is not an issue and we don't have controller based uh, CRD version discovery anymore. Um, the thing that I'm challenged with is figuring out what sort of interface that I could optionally inject into custom resource handling that would allow us to serve inherited CRDs from a different logical cluster that upstream would accept. Like I can go code whatever for the prototype and make it work, but I kind of want to at least have in mind what would we potentially want to try and get upstream. And I just don't know what so, concepts would fly. Okay. So they're early. So I would say this is I'd probably get down to the point of like, what's an interface that hides the problem that is reasonably abstract for the for the problem we are fixing in cube, and then think about composing that. I think the problem is, is that and I was thinking about this with like storage and registry. They're both existing APIs. It's a big hurdle to change those APIs. Like, like, it's something that somebody has to go take time away to review. And like, I think there's a, is there any problem that overlaps with it is usually my existing one is like there any problem we know about with how the CRDs and that is like, it's an efficiency thing, right? Like CRDs are still a big chunk of memory in the API server. Uh, you know, you'd want to come up with an interface that actually lets you, you know, solve the problem or improve something else. Those are the easiest ones. I'd say the rest of it is we're going to like, these are great questions to ask Andy. Um, it comes down to, is this a, is this a code cleanliness that benefits everybody? And the things that SIG API machinery is comfortable doing, we need to like be actually asking ourselves, like what makes our long-term maintenance of the Cube API servers easier? Um, are there performance wins, efficiency wins, uh, or are there other features that would benefit from having this abstraction in place? 
Um, those are usually the three that we've used so far in the KCP side. I think we wrote those down somewhere early on um, when we were like Jason and David and I wrote down some stuff like that early on, but we haven't gone back to it in a while. Um, I'll see if I can find the doc I wrote up okay. on it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically what I'm trying to work through is can I come up with an interface that doesn't look like it's solely for the express use for supporting logical clusters and the concept of workspaces and API inheritance, which I don't want to shove down to Kubernetes. So you need to know what the interface looks like. And then a bunch of people who probably know the code are going to be like, does this interface have to look like this? And then ask those questions. So at least getting to a point where you have an interface is. Yeah. Um, the other bit is, so, and this is like minimal API server. Minimal API server is a is a goal probably most people kind of agree with. A lot of what we're doing is a very specific combo of those yep. APIs. Um, I think there can be a reasonable argument made if you could, if we look at minimal API and what the like the hundred line example of someone pulling together a Cube API server that uses a different storage interface or brings in some of the Cube APIs and other others like Jason's uh, Jason uh, Tiberius's um, you know, yeah. cut out all the other stuff like any of those things if you can come up with a hundred line example where the interface plug points are reasonably justified for the um are reasonably justified for the also solves logical cluster injection in places because the interface is coarse enough where you can compose it that's probably better right now cube is not composable in any yes. way we started that way and then over time like we kind of as we got more complex like the composability just wasn't Composability by itself is not a goal. Um, and so, you know, even though early cube probably pre 1.0, there's a lot of places where we actually did have very nice interfaces where we're like, yep, bring these 10 pieces together in a hundred line go file and you've got a cube server. Over time, as we added new concepts, we cut through some of those. I would probably say the minimal API server is where we would, once we have a couple examples of the interfaces, we might say, here is a way that you could do this. And we think this would work because we've got some real examples of wanting to do things that are different than cube, but still reusing server side apply. And that's the more, that's the long term, like bringing more people playing in the code ecosystem and willing to support the code. Like at some point, we're basically just saying people need to pony up and support API machinery. And the cost and the price of supporting that sometimes is going to be a little bit of abstraction to get more use cases under the tent. And sometimes there'll be too many abstractions under the tent. Like that would be the risk is we have too many abstractions and core cube gets worse. Okay. Yeah. So I'll get back to trying to do some interface work next week after the holiday. And um, basically that means I, we're probably going to end up throwing away aggregator based discovery and the current CRD discovery implementation and replace it with one of our own for the time being. And I'll have to see what I can do for actual handling of CRs um, because that'll need the same sort of abstraction to figure out where the CRD is coming from. But the storage would obviously differ because you'd want it stored in the desired workspace, not in the workspace that owns the CRD. So I'll work through that or start to work through that more next week. Um, I think that's all I had for this topic. Cool, thanks. Um, Clayton, you have 13 minutes to dump on us everything you know about databases. This is gonna be really fast. <laughs> um, so uh, like as we were kind of working through like sharding, one of the big questions is, um, you know, is etcd really the optimal store? for some of the global geo problems. So I think it's useful to say, um, we started down a path, we were asking about etcd and we said, okay, like, is this the only path? So the sharding doc has two options and I added a third recently. So option one is the current bunch of small etcds, logical clusters live on each etcd. We reuse a lot of the cube code as it is today. Don't have to think about too many changes. Each of those shards is a failure isolation unit. There are some fixed limits on how much those shards can grow, million, million to 10 million keys, and then they fall over because that's what etcd, that's what SCD roughly gets to today. But that also corresponds roughly to the amount of memory that the API servers use for watch caches. Um, it also corresponds to like roughly, it's roughly proportional to the garbage controller keeps every object in memory as well. So there's a bunch of keep every object in memory such that 
the natural working set of a cube cluster or a set of a cube problem is something around 100,000 to 10 million keys um, that would fit on a single server in memory. So then the all, and then when we talk about uh, sharding, um, we were like, okay, can we stitch those up consistently? Which is a bunch of little shards. How do you do lists across them? That means you've got some other shard that's got a consistent, it's got a source of truth, and then you can hit that source of truth. But that's another actor that you have to talk to. So you have to talk to the consistent source of truth, and then talk to all the individual shards. And if the consistent source of truth is down, um, you, we need to come up with special rules about how long do you wait. Um, you know, can that shard be out of date? You've got to have there's certain properties that controllers depend on to keep their caches updated correctly, which Steve has been enumerating. All that basically led to the question of, this is a lot of work. We understand why it might be very valuable to have individual failure domains, because individual failure domains that match the working set of a problem is basically all of computing, right? Like even a database is like, if your database stops being able to hit working set, you're likely to transition from a very happy regime to a very unhappy regime where suddenly you know, like there's really no practical way around. Like, only a certain number of workloads don't really fit in memory. The vast majority of all, you know, API driven services roughly are memory. Like they have to work from memory. So we're still, we still got the fundamental. We're trying to break the problem up into chunks of working set memory that fit on a single machine. So the alternative is, could we move the data problem out to a more capable store? Um, something that actually gives us some of the same properties with geo replication distribution, failure mode. Um, there's only a couple of options really out there, which is if we just replaced etcd with a SQL database or etcd with another key value store that's local, we haven't really, we're basically replacing one type of option one with another type of option one. Um, the question I think we're considering for option one versus option two is if you moved all storage out, then uh, you have more work at the under layers of cube and uh, that we'd have to do to change that. But you might be able to get some wins, such as we wouldn't have to model move. If you had a geo-replicated database, of which there's a few out there, um, you would potentially have to deal with the fact that that database is a single point of failure. So you need to understand the failure characteristics of that. And then you need to think about, um, are there things that that would give you that option one does not? that are a meaningful trade-off where you'd say, oh, okay, well, maybe we'd still have the working set in memory in the KCP instances, but the backend store, you know, the working set actually is distributed across a bunch of servers and that database does a better job of distributing working set and falling over when your working set falls out of memory, then we would, we can short circuit a whole bunch of duplicating complex database theorems class uh, and catch up to the state of the art and then maybe come back to it three, four years down the road and say, oh, you know, sharding. So concretely, um, there's really two options that are open, broadly supported and accessible in a way that would work in multiple cloud environments. And it's basically, uh, there's a number of options and I'll have a doc that kind of goes through some of these and explains reasoning, but uh, all of the, uh, I kind of rejected out of hand, all of the existing databases that don't implicitly support a multi-geo strongly consistent approach because ultimately um, those are a step backwards because for all of etcd's faults it is a strongly consistent survives one failure replica almost effortless um, three instance resiliency like in the seven years of cube the problem has almost never been etcd in any practical scenario I can think of when we are within the bounds of usage. So if we brought Postgres, which could be much faster on in single instance, it wouldn't actually help us because Postgres multi-cluster or multi-HA is possible. Um, it's very complex. We would essentially be duplicating the same problems in option one. A geo-distributed database, Cockroach and Yugabyte are roughly there. Cockroach is about maybe a year ahead maturity model wise. Um, they're kind of getting to the point now where they're credible. Um, and so I've spent some time just familiarizing myself with the database, the access patterns that we use. I was looking at Kine, which Kine is an etcd adapter. So it implements the etcd gRPC API as a shim process and it sits in front of a database using that in front of Cockroach. Um, there's some tr uh, trade-offs that Kine had to choose to work generically across SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, um, which I think is a completely different set of trade-offs than we're exploring. 
Um, so they made some choices in how they modeled watches, roughly, basically to model a watch, they had to do something fairly inefficient because Postgres by default does not implement a strongly ordered um, history. Cockroach does by default. So uh, I've been going through Steve's uh, list and watch semantics, which are actually very useful. I came up with a couple of other properties that I'll add into some of the docs. Um, understanding the access patterns and what consistency guarantees. I'm fairly certain at this point, Cockroach actually now finally fully supports, um, but I have not tested, fully supports the semantics we would need for a repeatable historical list without an additional construct in the database layer, which is roughly on the underlying level, uh, you can receive a total, a, a, a consistently ordered history of rights within the GC interval, which is 24 hours by default on a cockroach database, which is tunable, but you can list as of a timestamp and then get a change feed, which is what they call it from that timestamp. You can repeat that timestamp or you can repeat that change feed consistently. And then when the time the feed ends, um, you can effectively use the timestamp of the last entry as the starting point of the next one if you needed to. There's some subtleties there that need to be tested. Um, as I said, like Cube has compaction intervals where we basically, Cube is telling etcd to do the compaction, which clears old history every five minutes. Um, Cockroach scales much better in that dimension, um, but I'm still kind of looking at some of the trade-offs and the running footprint of simple writes. Um, so in theory, watch is fully supportable. Even things like uh, uh, bookmarks, in the watch stream, there are Cockroach DB equivalents today, um, which is you can have the server keep a liveness that tells you the timestamp if there's been no updates over a change. Uh, all that needs to be tested, like probably something along the lines of Steve, your consistency testing of some of those watch semantics. So I probably at some point will try to get enough documentation down that we can either, I can do an experiment or somebody else will have the necessary inputs to go through the experience. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, watch performance. Oh, performance. So the biggest challenge, I think, from a straight up apples to apples comparison between etcd and um, Cockroach or other databases is, in theory, like in practice, a Postgres instance might actually be faster than etcd on linear single key contended writes to the same object if you take all indices out of the picture, right? Like. In theory, Postgres should be as fast or faster because there's a much more optimized write path on single key updates to a single row in the database. Um, and like Post, both Postgres and etcd both are establishing a MVCC history. So they're writing a set of rows. Postgres mostly puts that on the covers. Cockroach does something very similar. Cockroach has more coordination overhead. Um, so I haven't yet gotten into a spot, but I want to measure the apples to apples linear write rate in a cube-like fashion for a single contended key between both cube over etcd, cube over something that's like a close enough to equivalent, uh, whether it's kind or something else over cockroach, single key contended write on something that looks like our schema direct to etcd, which I know roughly what it is. Like in a on a fast NVMe disk, you can probably get something on the order of like 3,000 writes per second on a single key in etcd. Um, in, a, in a raft quorum, it's probably gonna come down a bit because you still have to do round trips. So like single key writes ultimately will be contended um, the more scale you have. So probably all things being equal, I think Cockroach is gonna be in striking distance performance, but there'd be a bunch of work we need to do to validate that a single key write. Um, I'm not worried about reads right now. Um, that's probably, uh, there's some overhead there that we need to think about. Like again, Cube has overhead on the right path that is probably more than what an equivalent database would have. So it's likely that Cube's latency on writes is gonna dominate whatever the data store is, but that needs to be verified. Um, and then the failure modes of Cockroach, like at the end of the day, like if option one is about us solving failure modes ourselves, and being able to model them. So you're like, hey, these workload, these workspaces want to deal with this, like have these constraints and this, you know, sharding puts them in the right places. And then 
you can say, oh, well, you're high level control plane. Um, you only lose that when Europe goes down or something. And what are the equivalent trade-offs for cockroach, which is, you know, what is the, the way that it works under the covers? There's a lot of similarities there. Um, the goal would be to write something up so we could see like, if we go down option one path, we get these benefits, but we have to solve all these problems. Option two, we would be trading for a different set of um, short-term things. Uh, which one is operationally more valuable for us in the short run might be, and how much work it is in the short run. Option one kind of has an advantage there. Um, at least right now, we think we could go to prototype phase and early development without really having to do all the scaling, hard scaling problems on sharding. But the data storage one would be, um, you would get some things just for free, like movement, which uh, you know is not trivial, um, but needs to be tested. So at the current time, there's a bunch of open questions. I'm trying to get the doc together. It does seem like there's a promising set of trade-offs. My gut's kind of telling me that it probably just makes more sense for us to continue in the option one path for right now, no matter what, because we need to be able to answer the question of like, can we have a single set of instances for prototype two? And then an initial version of like a service thing where you can just run a couple of instances. The moment we have to start tying those instances together, we probably only need a minimal set of sharding story, which is the root shard probably based on what Stefan and folks have kind of sorted out. Like we probably think we can fit the scale dimensions of a single master etcd or control plane uh, root shard and then have a bunch of like smaller shards to get to the next level of scale is where we have to seriously answer those questions and where option two might be there and then there's option three which is a hybridization of that model uh, which um, some of the inputs to that would be uh, maybe we actually would like the sharded data to stay in etcd and then anytime you have an api problem that's like i need millions of these or i want global distributed we put an adaption layer on top of it. That might actually allow us to do both in parallel and then you know, keep option two as a, maybe they could converge once we've developed some work there. So that's a, that's a set of trade-offs for APIs that don't quite fit the current cube model. But when you start getting into tens of millions of keys in a problem, maybe that actually would become more reasonable. Um, so, and obviously indices across tens of millions of things are what databases eat for breakfast. So some of the sinker problems might mm -hmm. actually make more sense modeled option two. It's just sinker is one particular problem and it wouldn't necessarily help all the other controller patterns that we might want to work. Sinker is very important though. T transparent multi-cluster is important. So, okay, that's it. Yeah, I was going to have, you beat me to the answer to the question of is either one going to be better for the virtual workspace concept we are the, you know, the, the, um, materializing I, fake I, things uh, better. Everything that we're describing as option one of like, how would we make the access pattern of a high cardinality is basically something that a distributed database at least solves, which is if you have a core model that works well and you can build a secondary index and you're willing to accept the trade-off of the secondary index, you'd say, um, yeah, you just add the secondary index and boom, your access pattern is roughly solved. In practice, the one question we have not answered is whether those are the only control plane patterns that would matter. So like a lot of the sharding, there's a sub thread of sharding, which is like, if we're trying to break things up into working set of memory, that's a code problem and a modeling problem and a storage problem. Um, is that really the most important thing we have to solve? Or can we just like cube hand waved it, right? Every problem in cube roughly fits in like trivial amounts of memory as far as like hard computer science problems go we may get a little bit of flexibility um i think i want to get i want to get more clarity on what the um do we have examples of problems that are hard from a distributed scalability problem that we can make substantially easier if you do these three simple things yeah uh cool thank you for sharing that and i look forward to hearing more uh either about how it definitely works or how it definitely doesn't or I forgot. Oh, it, I, I realized how much SQL I've forgotten in the last 10 years dealing with etcd and cube all the time. <laughs> First of all, it's pronounced SQL. And on that note, uh, we will see you all next week. Yeah, it's like saying it's <laughs> ETCD. Perfect. See you. Or cube cuddle. <laughs> see you, everyone. See you, bye. Stop recording. Stop recording.